Hello. This presentation covers the section on teachers and learners, and we're going to start off with teachers. And we could start with a question, what makes a good teacher? I think every person that we ask, if we ask them to provide us with ten things that might be in their list, then we could come up with some things that are common to everyone. Studies that have been done throughout the world tend to come up with the top three being that the teacher is fair, Secondly, that they have knowledge of the subject that they are teaching. And finally, that they can motivate the students to learn. So the role of the teacher within the classroom is going to be very wide and it will often change from moment to moment. In order to illustrate some of the things that the teacher could be doing at various times, we're going to use some of the things that they might say or some of the things that they may write down and from those we'll have a look at the role of the teacher at that point in time. So the teacher may say, for example, OK, everyone stop and look at me and I will explain. And the role of the teacher at that particular time is that of a manager. So the teacher is actually managing what is going on in the classroom. Second thing that they might say Okay, you're going to work in pairs, and that's you, and you, and you, and so on and so forth. So what the teacher is doing at this stage is actually acting as an organiser. Third example. may say something like that was an excellent point John and what he's doing there is acting as an assessor to the information that he's been given. For our fourth example something like Good. And what did you see at the cinema? So what we're doing here is we're moving information along and the teacher is acting as a prompter of information. Fifth example. Those have all been very good examples that you've given. My own worst nightmare is... teacher is therefore becoming part of the class itself and we could call that acting as a participant. Next one talking to a pair who are working, okay, you're both nearly right, but, and then go on to explain something. When working with individuals or with small groups, 
you're acting more as a tutor than a teacher for the whole class. Next example. Having done certain bits of work, we can now say to the students, OK, now create your own postcard. And the teacher there is acting as a facilitator. Example number eight. The teacher may say something like, OK, now listen carefully to the way in which I pronounce this word. So what the teacher is doing in this case is actually modelling the language, acting as a model. <clears throat> For our final example, whilst an activity is going on, the teacher may write a note to himself. Joe and Lecker up to number nine in this particular activity. So what the student, uh, what the teacher is doing at this point in time, is to act as a monitor for the class. So assessor, prompter, participant, tutor, facilitator, model, and monitor are some of the roles that a teacher will play. Which role that you have at any particular time in a lesson just depends entirely what is going on in. So moving on from teachers to learners, we need to bear in mind that our learners will bring different things to the classroom in terms of their experience, in terms of their motivation to actually be there, and in terms of their behaviour once they're actually there. So we're going to draw out a table of those different factors depending upon the student's age. We're going to split up our age groups into, firstly, what we'll call the young learners section, and secondly, the adults. Within the section of young learners, we need to break those down further into some subgroups depending upon their age. So whilst different people have, may have different classifications for what they consider to be young learners, we'll take it anywhere between the ages of 2 and 18 and we'll split them down into those subsections. 2 to 7 years and 8 to 13 years and then finally 14 to 18 years. Within each of those age groups then, what are the different motivations that these students bring to the classroom? What different experiences do they bring to the classroom and what types of behavioural differences are there? We'll try to give two examples for each of these. If we run through the two to seven years for each of those three factors, thinking about motivation, well in terms of motivation, the two to seven year olds, one of the main motivators for them while at school is to actually please their teachers. The other motivating factor that they bring with them at that particularly young age is the fact that they are keen. <coughs> what experiences do they bring? Well, obviously, at that age, their experiences are going to be limited in terms of life experiences. And indeed, at this very young age, they may not even have mastered their own native language. And we'll take that native language, we call that L1. 
the language that they're learning, L2. What types of behavioural conditions do they bring to the classroom? Well, obviously, at that very young age, they have a short attention span. But they do have a great sense of fun, and they do like to play. Let's run through now for the 8 to 13 year olds and what type of motivations do they bring to the classroom? Well, at this particular age, friends are becoming more important and this brings with it some positive and negative factors. Another thing about this particular age group is they can become self-absorbed. It's not unusual to see a five-year-old playing with a toy for hour after hour on an end without thinking about anything else. Moving on to their experiences that they've had. Obviously they will have gained some knowledge by the age of 13 of their own native language in fact, they'll be pretty along the way to everything they're ever going to know about it. Quite possibly, they will have some second language knowledge through their teaching. What sort of behaviours do they have? Well, between the ages of 13 In general, they tend to be receptive to their teaching, and secondly, they tend to be a little less worried about making mistakes in their language learning at this age. Moving on to the 14 to 18 year olds, so the adolescents, their motivating factors tend to move away from themselves and more to their peers. So, here, so peer pressure tends to become a, a bit of an issue and also we have the fact that they have to be there. Quite often at this age they don't have any choice about actually being there and that can create its own problems. Here they will have a good knowledge. Of L1 and Most likely, they'll already had some learning of some form or other in L2. What about their behaviours? Well, this can be a very difficult time for teenagers. They tend to be self-conscious, first of all. And unlike these students at the younger age, they tend to be less... likely to take risks in front of their peers for fear of ashaming themselves. Then moving on to the, the whole different section of adults, obviously in terms of motivation, with an adult class they don't always have to be there, they've often made the choice to be there. Although this is not always the case. And secondly, quite often this decision to actually be there is an economic one. In other words, by learning English, they can greatly increase the income that they can produce.
more often than not, obviously they will bring a lot of experience to the classroom. And they'll probably have had quite a lot of language learning experience. In terms of their behaviour, because of their previous experiences, they will either have had positive or negative previous experience. In other words, they may have certain behaviours that they're expecting to occur in these particular classes. And secondly, because they have been through lots of language learning before, they will come with certain fixed expectations. One final consideration for the categorisation of your language learners is actually their language level. So what language level are the students at? Assuming that your class is not a mixed ability class, and more about that later, then your students will have had some form of level test to put them into one type of category. And typically, There are five different levels of grouping. And some common names that are given to these particular levels are level one, the most basic level is called the starter group. Moving on from that, elementary, the next level beyond that Level 3, the pre-intermediates, and then on to 4, the intermediates, and the top level, the upper intermediates. What we can put here is some general characteristics of those learners. Within the starter level, there are actually two categories, and whether they be true starters where they have no experience at all. If you can think of a language that you have absolutely no experience in and can't say a single word of, then you are a starter in that particular class. There's another category within this one, though, which we call the false beginner. And the false beginner has actually had some exposure to the language, be it through TV, radio, perhaps they've met tourists in a particular destination, or so on and so forth, or, indeed, perhaps they've been taught this language a long time ago and have not used it for a long time, but they're still in the starter level. The next level up in the elementary, they will have a basic knowledge of things like subjects and verbs. And a fairly limited vocabulary that will allow them to talk about a limited range of subjects. Moving on to the next level at the pre-intermediate, they should be able to discuss a number of topics. But within those discussions, they will still make some basic errors in both language and vocabulary.
Moving on to the level four or the intermediate students, they should be able to discuss a large range of topics. But there will still be some issues in terms of both their fluency and their accuracy. And finally, into the upper intermediate, they should be able to discuss virtually anything that you can come up with, and they should have uh, a fair deal of fluency, although there still will be some problems with accuracy. <laughs>